Hello, welcome to Raptor Talk. I'm Marites Vitug, and joining us, not for the first time, is Daniel Wagner. He's CEO of Country Risk Solutions based in New York, and he's author of a second book on China with the title, The America-China Divide. And it's so timely to talk about this book, although not because of the, of the reasons the book came out, but for another reason, the coronavirus. Welcome to Raptor Talk, Daniel. Thank you for making time. And it's so good to be back with you and back with Rappler. Yes, yeah, so uh, 2019 March was our last interview. But Daniel, can you show us first your book? So it's because we don't have a copy yet here, although I've read parts of it. Can you show sure. us the America? Here's, our, here's my shameless plug of the book. <laughs> <laughs> no, we all do that. So the America-China Divide is your second book on China, right? Yes. Yes, okay. Now, without giving out spoilers, maybe just tell the readers what will be the takeaways from the book, at least, at least the main messages. So my view of the fissure between China and the U.S. is that it's much, much broader than just politics and economics. It encompasses so many other things, including you know, military competition, geostrategic competition, mm -hmm. uh, the environment, uh, uh, ideological issues, a whole range of things that I wanted to capture in this book so people could really think about it in context of the broader global picture. So specifically, I think you mentioned in your book that uh, between the eagle and the panda, that countries now should make a decision or are trying to make a decision on which country to go with. But in Southeast Asia, it's predominantly U.S. It's, there was a survey I mentioned, 53.6% of the ASEAN countries should, would rather go with the U.S., for the U.S. But Daniel, do countries have to choose? Can't we have both China and the U.S.? Well, so I reference also in the book a Pew study from 2019 that said more or less the same thing. It basically said in interviewing thousands of people from 25 countries that there are certain things that they like about the U.S. and certain things they like about China, but they don't want to be like China. Mm -hmm. And so if many countries of the world had to choose, they're still going to choose the U.S. Mm -hmm. But many of them are hedging their bets and they're trying basically to be in both camps at the same time. A perfect example of this is the U.K., which was under pressure from the U.S. not to let Huawei into their sensitive government systems. And they chose just a few days ago to let Huawei into part of the government sensitive mm -hmm. systems against the U.S. wishes. That may okay. affect uh, intelligence sharing between the two countries, for example. But there are lots of other examples, particularly in Asia, where they're doing both. They're being friendly with China and with the U.S. And you know, they're not having to make a specific choice. They can if they want to, but they don't have to. Most countries have the, 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 the option. Most of them choose to play both camps. And for example, in the Philippines, we have chosen to welcome Huawei in our military camps because this is the partnership between a Philippine, telco, a Philippine company and China Telco, which will be using Huawei equipment uh, so that's a choice that I think the Philippines is making. Uh, what's your risk, reading of the risk here? So the issue with Huawei is basically that it is closely linked with the Chinese Communist Party. They say they're simply a commercial entity, but there's plenty of evidence, and their links with the People's Liberation Army uh, point to this, that they aren't simply a purely commercial entity. And so the concern is, that the data that is obtained by virtue of operating with Huawei is then fed into the Chinese government, which I don't think many people or many governments or many companies would want. So complicating the issue is that we're talking about 5G. Huawei is the leader in 5G. They've already started on 6G. So where else do you go? There's a couple of European entities that are dabbling in 5G. but. Where else is the, is the world going to go for this technology? So it's a multifaceted, complicated issue. And if it was simply a commercial entity, then there would be nothing to talk about. But the U.S. has provided plenty of evidence to its allies that this is a real problem. 
talking about countries which have made choices, or at least specifically with certain projects. You gave your an exam. You gave examples in your book about Malaysia uh, saying no to China, and I think was it Pakistan saying yes to China. Can you walk us through the dynamics of of examples of countries trying to make choices? Sure. So in the case of Malaysia, this was back during the election when Prime Minister Razak was uh, trying to get reelected. What he did was he siphoned off some funds from the Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, to help in his election campaign. Uh, when Mahathir was elected, for that reason, and also because he knew that Malaysia could not afford, you know, twenty-two billion dollars of loans that, of course, ultimately had to be paid back. So he canceled those projects, and they were subsequently renegotiated and reinstated. In the case of Pakistan. They basically accepted in excess of $60 billion of funding from China, and this strengthened the bilateral relationship between the two countries. Uh, but what ended up happening is that they uh, accepted a lot of this money. Ultimately, that has to be paid back as well. Mm -hmm. And it became highly controversial because it was involved in some strategic assets, uh, railroads and ports and things along these nature. And, and, and it also, odd, oddly, had a very a deleterious effect on the environment. So what happened was a lot of the investment in Pakistan ended up being in coal-fired power plants. And Pakistan ended up doubling its coal emissions as a result of this, which severely affected the environment. So again, here's another multifaceted issue with lots of moving parts, and both of these countries had issues with it for different reasons. I just read recently, Daniel, that Thailand also scrapped a Chinese-led project to dredge the Mekong River. So this mm. is another example, mainly because of opposition from environmental groups and local uh, local uh, residents. So, um, so governments respond to public pressure if even if China, a powerful country, is involved. Is that your finding with other countries? You you know, certainly Thailand is one example. I would also point to a, mm -hmm. an even better example in Myanmar. There's something called the Mayitsun Dam, which was highly controversial for environmentalists. And they raised a real ruckus in Myanmar. And ultimately, the government backed down. But bear in mind you know, the very significant relationship that China has with the Myanmar government. So the fact that the government backed down turned out to be truly significant and really impacted bilateral relations in that regard. But we could point to lots of places all over the world where this sort of thing has happened, particularly in Africa. So it's, it's interesting you talked about Myanmar because uh, Myanmar recently was uh, ordered by the International Court of Justice to stop the killings of the Rohingya Muslims. But as we know, China is, doesn't say anything about this. It's even supportive of Myanmar's you know, uh, what infrastructure projects. So it's possible that Myanmar says no to China in this one project, but relies on it for, is dependent on it also for a protection when it comes to issues on human rights violations. Because if a country goes to the UN Security Council, then China is there as one of its protectors. So one of the reasons why so many countries are participating in the Belt and Road Initiative and are happy to accept tens of billions of dollars of funding from China, which ultimately, again, has to be paid back, is because China doesn't ask a lot of questions or raise a lot of fuss about things like human rights. And they don't supposedly tie a lot of strings to their money, although that's not entirely true either, because mm -hmm. there are plenty of contracts with these desperately poor countries, which are very, very onerous and are having to be mm -hmm. paid back purely on Chinese terms. And so some of these strategic assets in these countries are actually being seized by China. Sri Lanka is a good example with the Hambatota port. This strategic asset was highly controversial because it was seized by China when inevitably the tens of billions of dollars of debt are not repaid. So it's what they call a debt trap, and a lot of yeah. countries are falling into that. That then has had an impact on what has happened with the Belt and Road Initiative overall. You, you mentioned in your book about the decline of the Belt and Road Initiative, and it's no longer the much-touted big project that it used to be. What happened? What happened to, to the Belt and Road Initiative? <laughs> 
Well, as of 2019, some 700 plus billion dollars had already been invested in something like 160 countries. But the Belt and Road Initiative reached its peak in 2016. And in 2018, it was only half of the amount of investment that had been made in the prior year. Why is this happening? For several reasons. Of course, the, the, the trade conflict with the U.S. is having an impact on just how much extra money China has to, you know, to invest in other countries. But with the lack of repayment on many of these loans, the Chinese are themselves rethinking the wisdom of their original model. So this has potentially a happy ending in the sense that the Chinese government is relooking at the way they're doing this. And they're basically saying, maybe we should enter into this on a more equal and fair basis because we're getting a lot of pushback and a lot of resentment from a lot of countries. The other thing that's happening, of course, is that this is having a really significant impact on a lot of countries' ability to pay their international debts. Just uh, last month, Zambia was threatened by the IMF with being cut off because it was failing to repay its debt. This was going to have an impact on multilateral development bank lending as well. So we could go through multiple countries in Africa, for example, Kenya, which has in excess of $50 billion of, of new debt as a result of the BRI. So um, a lot of countries are rethinking the wisdom. China is rethinking just how it's doing business. And hopefully the remainder of the BRI will be on a more equal and fair basis. Mm -hmm. So you expect, uh, um, will this affect, you, you said earlier that China is really in the middle of its rise as a global power? Or how will this decline in the BIR affect its rise uh, to be the global economic and political superpower? So a lot of people in China think that this is, uh, if you will, their manifest destiny, mm -hmm. their, their destiny to retake the global mantle. Because let's not forget, 150 years ago, they were the top economy. Mm -hmm. And they're, they feel that they're just picking up from where they left off. But there's lots of troubles that are brewing. You know, the trade, uh, the trade issues, the coronavirus, um, a lot of uh, challenges that come with stepping up to global leadership. But one of the issues that I raise in the book is whether China actually is truly qualified to take the mantle from the U.S. I mean, China's very good at using the existing international system to catapult itself mm -hmm. to greater and greater things. But when it comes to original thinking on global problems and doing things in a way that is acceptable to a lot of other countries, rather than just bulldozing things through, as, as the Chinese government is sometimes accustomed to do, um, this is another issue. But the U.S. is stepping back at this time. I mean, uh, it, it has given the space for China really to, to rise. So uh, November 2020 will be your elections. And if Trump wins, then this will be a continuous uh, stepping back of the U.S. Or do you foresee a change after 2020? Yeah, that's a good question. Of course, it depends on who gets into the White House. But mm -hmm. assuming that Trump were to be reelected, there's pretty much no doubt that there's going to be a continuation of the theme that's been started under his reign. Personally, I'm actually glad that Mr. Trump has uh, taken China to task because they've been doing what they've been doing without virtually any opposition from the U.S. for decades. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't necessarily like the way he's done it, but I like the fact that he's done it. And I actually think, and this may be controversial, that it's almost a favor to China that he's taken them on like this because it's forcing them to rethink the way they do things in the world, to pivot and re-strategize. And they're very, very good at doing that. So the U.S., as you say, is basically asleep at the wheel while all this stuff is going on. You know, what China was doing in the South China Sea, they basically did completely unopposed, mm -hmm. almost with a wink from the U.S., which is astonishing to me. Uh, and so that has geostrategic impact. And many of the other things that are going on have global impact, mm -hmm. which is one of the core messages of the book. How about the coronavirus, Daniel? Will it also... Uh make China rethink the way it responds to domestic issues which have impact on international community. They're quite isolated now. I mean, physically, a lot of countries have shut down flights, borders. So what's the impact of this on China? 
You know, what's so interesting to me is looking back to 2002 and three when the SARS mm -hmm. epidemic was raging from China. And you look at the derivation of that. They were pointing to live animal markets then. So if that was the case, I find myself wondering, well, why didn't they just shut down the live animal markets? And why 15, 16, 18 years later are we back talking about the same thing? So that's one issue. But I see uh, you know, a pattern that was established in SARS, which is reestablishing itself here. And that is that on one hand, they're being transparent or at least wanting to make the appearance of being transparent in dealing with this internally and with the rest of the world. On the other hand, they're shutting down information flows mm -hmm. and they're being very selective in what they're sharing with information. My expectation is that the infection and death rates in China are much, much greater than they're talking mm -hmm. about now. And this certainly already has the potential to become a global pandemic. In fact, it's basically been declared as such. So my hope is that mm -hmm. this will teach a lesson to China, not only about how to prevent something like this from happening again, but also how to manage it more properly. And in fairness to the Chinese government, they've done a better job this time around than they did last time around. But one of the things we don't know mm -hmm. is whether this was the result of some virus that originated in a live animal market in Wuhan, mm -hmm. or whether it was the result of some biological agent which was accidentally released through these biological labs they have in the Wuhan area. And that remains to be seen and we'll probably never know the answer to that. Interesting. But uh, Daniel, your, the title of your book, The America-China Divide. In your book, you say you are in a multipolar world, but you focus on the competition between these two countries. And But if you look around, many countries are still within the U.S. Uh, alliance. So um, are we going back to a bipolar world? Yeah, I think basically that's what's going to happen here. We're already sort of in the middle of it. When countries are forced to choose, it's ultimately going to boil down to, okay, I'd rather perhaps be friendlier with the U.S. or be closer to the U.S., but at the end of the day, who's going to give me money to help develop and meet the basic needs of my people? And China, in, to their credit, has done a magnificent job of stepping up to the plate. They've done so with conditions through the BRI and debt trap diplomacy, but they're filling a gap that the multilateral de uh, development banks and a lot of governments simply cannot or are not able to fill. So I do give them credit for that. And a lot of people in Africa, for example, think very highly of China for having stepped up to the plate. A lot of their products, a lot of their companies are the top sellers in Africa. But I would just add one more thought on that, and that is that back in the 1990s, the highly indebted poor countries of Africa, there were 30 of the 36 total, were given debt relief. And now we find 20, 30 years later that they're back to being highly indebted poor countries. And a lot of that has to do with the willingness of China to lend and the willingness of these countries to take that money. So I'm also hoping that the recipient countries will start to look at how they're doing what they're doing and perhaps change what they're doing. That's a good lesson for the Philippines. As, uh, so far, we only have one China, big China-funded project. So if we look at, uh, if we read your book, if our policymakers read your book, then they'll have enough warning. Uh, Daniel, you also talked about real politics. I think earlier in our conversation, uh, where does trust does, doesn't trust play a role here? Don't because countries, at least. Philippines, Vietnam, the Sur Servicios, and other countries don't really trust China, but recognize that it's a power and that they don't have moral ascendancy because they have their own human rights violations. They, they don't speak against any human rights violations. So where's the trust and moral ascendancy here? So the question becomes whether there's room for yeah. trust and moral yeah. ascendancy in some of these bilateral relationships. Because at the end of the day, it's really becoming a dog-eat-dog -dog world where it's America first or the Philippines first or China first. Mm -hmm. And if everyone's looking out for primarily and in, in the first instance their own interests, then is there room for moral ascendancy? I mean, there should be. But it seems to me that we're experiencing a paradigm shift here. The ground is sort of shifting beneath our feet. And all of the things that are going on to, in America, which are you know, ground, ground shattering, and some of the things going on in China and many other places in the world, I mean, they're happening at the same time. Mm 
So that's one of the things about the Trump phenomenon here is that it's not just limited to America. There are strong men, you know, flexing their muscles all over the world as leaders. And that's a really frightening place to be for people from all over the world. But by the same token, uh, if democracy hasn't delivered what it was intended to deliver the way it was supposed to deliver it, uh, and if uh, more authoritarian regimes, uh, military regimes, for example, haven't delivered, then is the single strongman rule likely to, to be the order of the day for some time to come? I certainly hope not. Yeah, recently, um, Putin overhauled his government, and it appears that he may stay on much longer after being president for 20 years. You know, what worries us here is that he's an idol of our president. So mm. uh, anyway, going to another subject, you wrote this book in West Africa, in the Ivory Coast. Why did you choose yes. to write this book in that part of the world? <laughs> well, it's, so, it's sort of like the Ivory Coast chose me. <laughs> I was on a long-term assignment for the African Development Bank, mm. and I thought it would be a really great time to start thinking about some of these issues because, you know, if I'm sitting in New York my perch is America, right? But if my perch is West Africa and I'm working with lots of Africans, I'm traveling throughout Africa, um, I felt that that would give me a perspective that I didn't perhaps have by sitting uh, in the States. So I had the time, I had the initiative, and I decided it would be a good time to write this book. What was your, uh, what was the opinion about China? I mean, at least among people you spoke with uh, in West Africa. So, you know, most people in Africa more generally, they're not necessarily so focused on whether it's uh, an America or a, a China issue. They're focused on getting things done and feeding themselves and meeting their basic needs. Although that, that is the case, uh, many of the people that I spoke with about China had a sort of agnostic view. They were thinking, well, there's some, some definite pluses associated with you know, what China's doing in Africa. There's also obviously some definite minuses, but not every country has been negatively impacted. In fact, many, many jobs have been created. There's something like 10,000 Chinese entrepreneurial uh, businesses that have popped up throughout Africa. Uh, infrastructure is being improved as a result of what the Chinese are doing. So it's far from just a bad news story. And I think a lot of people in Africa are very cognizant of that. On the last, uh, maybe one last question, Daniel, is um, you said that China is trying to impose its own rules and order uh, on other countries. Again, my favorite example is the Philippines, and we won in an arbitration case against China. Uh, what can international organizations or countries do uh, to to pressure China to uphold the rule of law, not just here in South, South China Sea, not just on the South China Sea, but in other countries? I think it's really important for international organizations to first of all recognize the gaps and inconsistencies in their own way of doing business and in their own conventions, for example. Mm -hmm. Identifying that, then also identifying where China is doing things that perhaps it should not be doing, and then speaking up loudly and doing something about it. One of the biggest reasons why China's been able to get away with things like the South China Sea is that nobody really objected too strenuously. And China's masterful at taking two steps forward and one step back, and before you know it, you have a new line of demarcation, a new boundary. So if we're more cognizant of that and we recognize it, we call it out and we object to it and actually do something about it, that I think is the answer. Thank you very much, Daniel, for uh, joining us. And just to remind our viewers and listeners, they can order your book exclusively, right? Distributed by Amazon. Okay, and we can- That's right. Yeah, here in the Philippines, as we discussed earlier, I, I mean, we talked about off camera, is that readers or who want to have your book can just go to Amazon and order directly. And uh, it may take time as the mail can be slow, but thank but you. But the Kindle is immediate. Oh, <laughs> right. I'm thinking in terms of hard yes. copy. <laughs> yes. I'm quite traditional in that sense. <laughs> so thank you well, again. Well, thank you very much yeah. for having me on again. Yeah, really feel your it. next book.
fill your next book. There and will to be our, another. Yeah, to our readers, and uh, I'm sorry, to our viewers and our listeners, thank you for joining us, and we'll uh, keep you posted on developments happening in China and as well as the rest of the world.